I consider it an incredible privilege to be here today, and thank you so much in advance for your attention. Um, I run a company that tries to help other companies figure out social media. And as such, because I'm immersed in this new, exciting world, uh, and because I spend so much time talking about it, you wouldn't be blamed for thinking that I would be quite enthusiastic about it. But the truth is, I'm a little jaded. I'm, I'm a little cynical. And the reason I'm a little cynical is because there is absolutely no shortage of buzz and hype uh, around social media. Everybody's talking about Facebook's IPO and Twitter's upcoming IPO, the billion dollars that were paid for Instagram and the millions and millions of connections and relationships and uh, kilobytes and gigabytes of information that are transformed uh, and transferred on these platforms every day. But, but I wonder sometimes if social media is not perhaps a wholly inadequate term to express the largeness and the specialness of what's happening right now to us as a society, as customers, as employees, as business owners, as creatives, as people who have great ideas and want to change the world. I think that something much bigger is going on, and I'm, I'm, I'm worried that we don't have the vocabulary uh, and the perspective to articulate the scale of that change. So when I, when I try and find people who understand this, I, I, I did a bit of research and I, I came across a quote which I think embodies uh, the scale of this change quite nicely. And it's actually from 2006, so preceding uh, a time when, to, when uh, social media was a commonly used term. And it says, to, to find something comparable to what's happening right now, you have to go back to the printing press, uh, the birth of mass media. And uh, it speaks about how that printing press and what it brought to us 500 years ago really destroyed the old world of kings and aristocracies. It says that technology is shifting power away from the publishers, the media elite, the gatekeepers of influence. And technology is offering people the opportunity to take control. Now, interestingly enough, the person that said this was Rupert Murdoch, just after spending a couple of hundred million dollars uh, on MySpace. Unlucky. Um, so, so now, it's interesting to me because Rupert is pretty much the epitome of the media elite. Now, for somebody like that to say something like this, it signifies for me something much bigger than Facebook and Twitter. But I think he was wrong. I think that he put too much emphasis on the platform and not enough emphasis on the principles. Now, when I speak to clients about what social media means for their business, inevitably there are two distinct schools of thought. One school of thought says, this is about Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. It's about platforms, applications, websites, technologies that allow us to connect with our staff and customers in different ways. And therefore, you know, ergo, if we have a Twitter profile, we're a social company, we're a social corporation. And you'll know that that doesn't often happen. That's not always the case. In fact, it's very seldom the case. And I think the reason is that we as corporations, and I use that word very specifically, and I'll explain why later, but corporations idealize the behaviors and the principles and the values of a social web without thinking whether or not those values are replicable inside their business. And I would, I would venture to suggest that companies that are investing an enormous amount of money, time, and in, energy in creating a social profile online, a social brand, that is so utterly and dramatically divorced from what they actually deliver as a company, that's more of a risk than not having a social profile at all. So if you look at something like Wikipedia, this is an amazing platform. Uh, a platform that is supported by open source technology, which does some cool stuff. But it's not the technology that makes Wikipedia work. It's the values and the behaviors of the community that interact and connect on that platform and uh, voluntarily offer up enormous amounts of information. It's the radical trust, the decentralized collaboration, the openness, authenticity, uh, vulnerability that drives that platform. Now, if you think about those principles and values, they are in many cases diametrically opposed to the kinds of values that drive corporations today. Corporations are all about profit at the expense of people. I had a chat with the CEO the other day, and I said to him, how much of your business relies on the internet to work? And he said, oh, approximately 70, 80 percent. I said, that's interesting. How much revenue does that, that uh, equate to? He said, about $1.2 billion. I said, that's really interesting. Who owns the internet? No answer. Yeah. 
And that's, that's a critically interesting thought. So I think maybe like the, the frog in the hot water, or the toad in the hot water, we at the moment are unaware of the massive seismic impact uh, of these incremental changes on society and on us as individuals, and perhaps don't have the perspective yet to understand the impact on our outcome. And, and I would suggest that 50 years from now, 80 years from now, we'll look back on this time as being as significant as the introduction of the printing press in terms of its socioeconomic impact. I think what we're starting to feel, I think what we're starting to, uh, and, and I think depending on where you are in this equation, whether you're a business owner or an employee or a customer or whatever, we all feel a sense of pain, a, a sense of uneasiness. And I think what we're sensing is this big seismic shift from the industrial age to the information age. Now, those are very generic terms, and when you speak to futurists and historians, they love taking generations and shifts in from agricultural age to the uh, uh, industrial era or industrial economy. We love to box history and, and use that, that boxing or profiling to predict the future. I'd like to suggest, though, that we haven't quite understood the impact of the shift from industrial age to information age because corporations, the companies that drive our economies and in many instances make our lives meaningful through employment or through products and services, are entirely driven by industrial age principles. And if that's the truth, then we're, in, we're, we're being confronted with a reality that means that our, our information age reality is headbutting against our industrial age legacies. Now, when you look at what historians say about the industrial age and the information age, they track back to a single year. They say 1989 was a very significant year for a number of reasons. So I did a little bit of homework around 1989. And there were a couple of big political things that happened in 1989. And you might remember some of them. Uh, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, that was a massive political event. Uh, Tiananmen Square. Okay, Here, a little bit closer to home, F.W. de Klerk, uh, rather P.W. Boote, the Groot Krokodil at that stage, had a, a, a meeting with uh, Madiba and uh, later in that year resigned and F.W. de Klerk was, was instated as the seventh and last state president of apartheid South Africa. Big political shifts, uh, uh, you know, close to home. But from a technological perspective, there were some very exciting things that happened as well. So Tim Berners-Lee um, wrote a proposal for what he called uh, a hypertext web, a worldwide web that would link an internet of computers in a way that would offer access to ordinary people like you and me. This was the computer that he wrote the proposal on. It's quite cool. It says, this machine is a server. Do not power down for people that can't remember things like me. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the first of 24 global positioning satellites was launched into orbit. Nintendo launched its Game Boy, one of the first mobile gaming units uh, that we ever had at our disposal. And Edward Lance, who was a former NASA employee, uh, generated the first text message using a Motorola beeper. This all happened in 1989. And Back to the Future, of course, which was a great film that I'm also very enthusiastic about. But that's not part of my presentation. So, so if, if 1989 is a big year, and, and I, you know, in doing this research, I stumbled across an article uh, published by Time magazine that spoke about 1989 being the year that the world pivoted on its axis. And obviously, I mean, on either side of that particular year, there, there are significant things that contribute towards this industrial to information age shift. But if 1989 is a big year, then I guess the important question for us as people who deal with corporations, in some cases work in corporations, but uh, no doubt interact with corporations on a daily basis, is where are the 1989ers? Where are the people that were born in that era? Where are the people that have absolutely no comprehension of a reality that does not involve radical collaboration, radical trust, openness, authenticity, sharing, that, that is a generation that does not understand many of the principles that fundamentally drive good industrial age business. You know, they think about a world that is not about profit at the expense of people. They think about a world, sometimes not about profit at all, but profit as a byproduct of happy, engaged, and healthy people. Okay? They're graduating. They are now entering our businesses, our corporations, uh, the, our place of work. They, for the first time ever, have disposable income. Uh, and they're starting to spend, and their buying habits are fundamentally different to anything we've experienced before. Now, a lot of my, my customers go, this is social media. It's not social media. This did not happen because of Facebook and Twitter. Rather, social media is one of the byproducts of a fundamental need of this generation to have a better way of connecting, 
a better way of sharing information, a better way of creating relationships, even if we as, you know, I'm, I precede 1989 by a couple of years, we won't say how many, um, but, but for us it feels different, it doesn't feel right, the way that language is being used, the way that relationships are being formed, the way that teenagers can sit at a dinner table for three hours and not speak to anybody there, that's not right. Is it not right or is it just different? Is it just how they define meaning, okay? So, so I believe that our industrial age legacy is butting heads with our information age reality, and I think that is the source of a lot of pain that we blame on social media. And I think that that's a great opportunity for us to say, what can we learn from 1989ers? What can we learn from the values that define social engagement? Uh, if this internet is in its infancy, and if it has, in many instances, defined how these young people live work, breathe, exist, and create meaning, then it has to be fundamental to our businesses because businesses employ and sell to these people. Young people today believe that they're important because they're, they're published. And this has probably been, if we narrow social media down to its most basic common denominators, it's that ordinary people have the opportunity to publish. And when ordinary people publish, everything changes. In the past, when you wanted to publish, you went and got a degree, you spend three years learning about the rules of publishing, of media, of influence, of objectivity. Today you register a Twitter account and you're a journalist, okay? apparently. And that's, that's a scary dynamic. So when everyone is a publisher, all the rules challenge, uh, change. The second thing they believe is that they have a profile. I uh, found a, a fascinating article the other day that speaks about why Generation Y is so unhappy with life. And it's because they're all building social profiles and establishing social graphs and then comparing the validity and the value of their lives against the idyllic representation of their friends' pictures online. You know, every profile picture has a filter. Why? Because you want to look better in the profile picture. You only post the positive stuff about your family. Nobody ever gets to hear the negative stuff, you know? If you followed my account, you'd think I'd never worked, okay? You'd think I played golf all day long. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and so we, we have this idyllic representation. We publish, we create a profile, we create an idyllic representation of our, our lives, and as a result, we're all kind of unhappy because people tend to compare their happiness by their friendship circle, their social graph, uh, and they believe that they're special. Um, my dad's generation grew up in a world where you, know, you got, a, you got a, a degree or a trade, um, you, you, you got a good job in a big company. You kept your head down. You didn't get into trouble, and you know, after, after 40, 45 years, you uh, retire, you get a gold watch, and you rust in peace in Hermanus. You know, that's, that's the deal. That's the, that was the ideal existence. Every young, people that you, uh, every young person that you speak to today wants to change the world and believes that they can. And that's interesting. It's great <laughs> because we have a lot of very optimistic, um, uh, very proud, uh, and very individualistic young 89ers coming up. But, but can we scale that? So what does that mean for corporations? I keep on coming back to corporations. I think that, if nothing else, the last six or seven years of social business has forced companies to recognize the humanity and individuality of their staff and customers. We've been obligated, forced, to recognize the humanity and individuality. Gone are the days of the human assembly line. We have to acknowledge the, the importance and the specialness of everybody within our organization, because we never know when the next one is a blogger or a tweeter or a Facebooker or has 10,000, you know, a, a clout score of 75 or trends or you know, all these weird and wonderful things that we feel so threatened by as an organization because it doesn't speak to our inherent um, uh, misfit. It speaks to the fact that we just don't know how to scale these things. Corporations cannot be humane. Okay? We can be machines. Now, the interesting dynamic is that 150 of the top economic entities in the world are made up 60% by corporations. They're not countries, they're corporations. That's not awkward at all. Um, and that's fascinating to me because that means that corporations run this world. Okay? This world, our societies, our <laughs> commerce, economies, politics are driven by economic entities which are driven by corporations. And if corporations are struggling to scale humanity, what does that mean for us long term? What does that mean for us in the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years? And what will we infer from this big shift, this, these six or seven years of social business, when we look back on it 60 or 70 years from now? What perspective will we have and how big a shift will it have been? I think that this is it. I think that in a world where everything is commoditized, 
where it's virtually impossible to differentiate on product or price or positioning or any of the traditional P's anymore. The only thing that corporations have left to differentiate on is their personality, their ability to scale humanity. And as I said early on, uh, the difference between what corporations say they can do and what they can actually do, what they promise and what they can deliver, determines their credibility. And those that aren't credible aren't getting chosen. We don't want to buy from them. We don't want to work for them. And uh, we don't want to see them succeed. So I want to end with that thought. Um, if humanity is possibly the only competitive differentiator that corporations have left today, how are we going to scale that moving forward? Uh, thank you very much for your time.